Hello, and welcome to Draft 2 Digital Self-Publishing Insiders. My name is Mark Leslie Lefebvre, and I am the Director of Business Development for Draft Digital, and I'm honored to have in the virtual studio with me today, Ryan Dingler. Ryan, welcome to the uh, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be on. So, <laughs> I'm so excited to talk about Google Play and all the amazing things you, you guys are doing. But first, what is your official title at uh, at Google Playbooks? So, so I am a product manager on and Playbooks. I've been on the team for about three years. Product manager, a little bit uh, not of a known function outside of uh, tech companies. I, I basically oversee a lot of the software that we're working on and uh, both on the consumer side and the publisher side. And I've had the fortunate uh, benefit to be able to work on playbooks the entire time I've been at, at Google for the, for those three years. Oh, that's exciting. So um, were you a book guy before you got into this? Tech guy, book guy, sort of a peanut butter and chocolate coming together? Was that what it was? Somewhere in the middle there, yeah. I, I've i never worked on books before this. I, I'm an avid reader myself. That's why I was attracted to it. But I was more in the tech realm, actually, like um, okay. more broadly. So I worked uh, on payments and things like that. Uh, but it's it's good to be able to combine my my hobbies with my work. It <laughs> makes work a lot easier. That's always that's always fantastic. So I um I just want to be clear for anyone watching. Yes, this is a draft to digital uh, interview with self publishing insiders, which we do every Thursday or almost every Thursday. I think we've only missed two this year in 2022 at 1 p.m. Eastern or uh, noon Central. And I want to be clear that draft to digital does not currently distribute to Google Play Books, but we're all about empowering and informing authors and giving them ideas on how they can be successful. So I'm really excited, Ryan, for you to be here. I just wanted to make sure people don't log into the Draft Digital dashboard and go, how do I get to Google Play? How do authors get to Google Play? We, it's, a direct, uh, it's a direct relationship, correct? Yeah, so it's a direct relationship. Uh, you can just go to Google, type in Google Play Books Publishing will be the first link that pops up there. And we have an easy online flow that you can go through. One of the reasons we have that we need a direct account is because of our relationship with Google Book Search. So, uh, you know, every time you put your book on Google Playbooks, it also appears on Google Book Search. Always confusing to say Google and books and the same thing and be different things. Right. Uh, but there is a, there is a connection there. Well, that's uh, yeah, because Google has long had the project that they want to have access to let people know about every book that's available in the world. So so when you go, uh, how does this process work when somebody goes to set up an account? Because I figure for anyone who doesn't know anything about Google Playbooks, let's let's walk them through the basics of getting set up, how it works, how much it costs them, all the things. Yeah, well, maybe we'll start off on cost. It, it is entirely free. Um, so you go through the online flow, you can, you say you know, the name of your publishing company, where you're located, uh, and then you agree to the terms and service. You hopefully sign up for some uh, emails to let it, so that we can let you know about important updates to your account and things like that. Once you come in, it's really about kind of fundamental stuff, dealing with setting up payments. You want to be able to get paid when you do sell your books, setting up right. your taxes so that we can uh, effectively uh, distribute the right amount of taxes. Once you get through all of that, like back end stuff, uh, you actually go to set up your book inside of our partner center, which that is the name of the product. Um, you do it one by one. You can do it through uh, bulk uploads. So most publishers don't actually know about this. So if you are just coming to us for the first time, and you have a very large catalog of books that you want to put on. It would be pretty time consuming to do it one by one. But you do have that ability. We have a nice new flow that we designed uh, almost two and a half years ago now. And um, you can go through that, or you can uh, do this uh, a function through bulk, where it's just you just upload the files. You need to give like specific namings to things like that, uh, and use CSV. There is a whole help center page to do it. Um, so if you're looking to upload 50 books at once, I would advise to go that way. Uh, right. And it's definitely good to have the complete set of your books uh, on Google Play, especially if they're in a series, because that's that's quite important. Well, I, I like that idea because um, it, it doesn't make sense to have the entry to go one by one. But authors who've been publishing for a long time may actually have a huge catalog, and that could take them hours to enter all their titles. So, so you have that template, you have the upload that really can save people a lot of time. Um, another thing that saves people time that I just want to address, but before I address that, I just have to pop up this comment from Craig who says, your dashboard on Google Books is the best of every platform. Love it. Yeah, that, that is great to hear. We worked quite hard on that uh, to get out. 
<laughs> well, one of the things I love uh, about the platform is uh, I've got a price promo coming up. Actually, uh, scheduled, it went live today on one of my books, but I set it up a couple weeks ago because uh, after I've set up my book and it's published and I have my metadata in there, I was able to schedule my price drop to begin at 12.01 a.m. local time. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but there's a couple key factors, I think, for Google Play. So Google Play is available. Uh, the Google Play Books Store is available in how many countries around the world? Uh, we we always like to say 75 plus. I think the actual number is maybe like 81, 80. Right. It, it fluctuates <laughs> a little bit every now and then. So you can set your price, not just in US dollars, but you can set your price in, in numerous currencies. So you have that flexibility, but then you can pre-schedule. So I, what I did is I went in and I scheduled a price change and it's going to drop on the day I want it to drop. And it's going to go back up on the day I want it to go back up. And I'm not sure how many authors are familiar with that. Yeah. So that is a functionality that we've had for, for quite a while. There is a new thing though, before you had to use uh, CSVs or Excel sheets to do it, uh, we made it so it's nice hopefully nicely intuitive for users and publishers to just go in and do it in the flow. Um, and yeah, exactly as you said, you can schedule something, you can schedule it to start. You, you actually don't even need to provide an end date, so you can have it going as long as you want. Um, oh, okay. And you can schedule months and months in advance so you have it all laid out. You want to go on vacation, have your books uh, price drop at the right time, uh, they can do that there. Can, uh, can authors do pre-orders on Google Play Books as well? Uh, you, you can do pre-orders. We right now have requirements that we need to have the content beforehand. Um, okay. We are working on this to do kind of contentless pre-orders, but uh, you do have the ability. And the only thing that we ask right now is that you provide the content in advance. Okay. All right. And that's, and that's probably a customer-centric perspective, right? You want to make sure that the book is ready to go. Exactly. Uh, and one thing to note on pre-orders, we have somewhat of a confusing interface that I'm trying to, to make a little bit better, but we always do get this question uh, about what is the difference between publication date and on sale date? Um, okay. This stems from Google book search where, you know, we're trying to catalog the world's information of books. And sometimes we get a book on our platform that is a hundred years old, but just released to our platform. So publication date is when it originally came out. So if you put something in there, it actually has no effect on the book going live. So you can say okay. it was, this was written in 1950, uh, but and then the on sale date uh, is what you where you put where you want to actually release it. If you leave it blank, it goes live immediately. But uh, if you put it in the future, that's when you'd be in the the pre order territory. Okay, so um, potentially this is a, a, a logistical question for authors who have published exclusively to some other platform that requires exclusivity all the time, mm -hmm. um, and then they want to release it wide and, and go to Google Play Books. Does that mean? In the publication date field, they would put the original publication date that it first came out anywhere, and then they would put in the on sale date on Google Play Books. That, that's exactly right, and it's okay. it's to help us understand uh, where that when that book was done uh, as part of it. One small tidbit that I always like to comment on that is not applicable to publishing specifically, but it's just if you ever gone to Google and search for a word, and they show you the popularity of that word over time, that is entirely driven by this publication date. Uh, so they're looking at books and they're saying wow. this book was published in 1950. So we can see how popular that word was in 1950. It's oh, called wow. uh, Ngram. It's one of my favorite, favorite functionalities from Google. Oh my God. There's all this, all this functionality that we're not familiar with. So, so let's get into some of the nitty gritty. Cause I know mm -hmm. uh, authors that are uh, watching live and will be listening to this later are probably curious about, okay, so what can I do when I'm setting up my book? What are the things I can do? How can I, you know, put how to put in the correct metadata to help optimize my chances of getting to the right customers uh, looking for books on Google Play? Mm -hmm. So there's obviously a number of components here. Maybe I will speak on a, a few broad ones. Some obvious things, book descriptions, very important. Uh, we yeah. recommend somewhere between 200 and 1500 words uh, in the book description. Um, and then and that's very important for search as, as most publishers know as part of it. We don't recommend uh, putting keywords in there. Just write whatever you think is specifically applicable to the book. Um, it helps better the user experience. On the okay. genre side, we recommend uh, putting in three subject codes, uh, only three. three. And we, may, we recommend ranking them actually in, in importance. Uh, okay. So you can put your most important one first and then your least important one last. That actually helps with um, structuring recommendations and for and for search. 
and probably one of the most important ones, although those are obviously those are kind of like ground stakes, table stakes for me uh, and most publishers is series metadata. You know, okay. A lot of publishers, uh, especially in the self-publishing community, have uh, books in a series, rightfully so, because it's a great tactic uh, to keep people reading, is to provide the, the correct series metadata throughout all books in the series. Uh, right now, the publishing industry doesn't have a great way to structure series. They have two kind of two fields to get really uh, logistical about it. They have a series name and a series number. Okay. And the series name, uh, we need it to be exactly the same across every single book. It's capital case. You don't put an extra capital in one and not another. Don't put an extra space accidentally at the end. We try to, we do try to clean up this stuff. Um, and then the series number is uh, hopefully whole numbers. Uh, you know, one, two, three, four, five. No, no gaps, no duplicates. As we like to say, okay. those things are actually much more important than I think publishers might realize because we build entire series experience for our users where they can go into a series and see it structured exactly how the publisher wanted it to be structured. And we build uh, tools around series like series bundles if they want to buy multiple books in a series at one time. So wait, so a customer on the Google Play Bookstore can purchase multiple books with one purchase and you don't have to bundle it yourself as a publisher or author? That's exactly right. And this is something we've been working on for wow. a couple of years. So okay. we call it series bundles uh, or okay. build a series bundle. And they have the ability to on the series page, which you only get if you incorrect, you input your series metadata correctly, there is a little module that says you can build a series bundle. Let's say there's seven books in the series. They could bundle, let's say they own book one and they want to buy books two through seven. Uh, they can do it that way. Okay. So it'll automatically, if the customer already owns one of the books, it'll automatically only sell them the ones that are in the bundle. Exactly. Or, uh, yeah. No, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. That is fantastic. I didn't, I didn't know about that one. I, um, I want to go back uh, to metadata. I know we're going to take uh, most of the questions later on, but I did get a question uh, that came up early on uh, from Jenny uh, that I think is important uh, to mention. And so she asks, uh, you said to list your publishing house, you know, when you first set up your account with Google Play, but uh, she says, well, wh what if we self-publish? Um, the publishing house actually isn't too important. It's more for the legal context of it uh, so that we know who we're dealing with. Uh, if you self-publish, you can just put your own name or whatever name and name you go by uh, kind of broadly across all of your books. Uh, it's less of a, a, of a tool that's used for consumers because they, they normally would think of, I, I buy from this author or I buy in the series. Uh, it's more for us to understand who is an entity we're dealing with. Okay, great, great. And, and uh, a follow-up question to what we just were talking about was the bundles. Uh, Stephanie asks... Do you have to have all the books up first, like a complete series before you can take advantage of that series bundling uh, tool, that functionality? You don't need all the books up. You do need two books up at least, uh, hence the, the part of the bundle. So all you need is two books in a series for it to start. And okay. just to tease a little bit, we actually spoke about this uh, like five to six months ago. What we've been working on it, we've been delayed a little bit. We actually have the ability to uh, let publishers provide series bundle discounts. And the way that you can think about this is it's like a box set. Okay. Um, it's not up today. I expect it to be out in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, but in a, in a box set, you have, let's say you have seven books in the series and you know if they buy individually, it's $70. If they buy all book all seven books together, the publisher would typically say like maybe it's 25% off. Okay. Um, so we have the same ability to do that in our in our store where a publisher can provide Kind of three tiers so you could say like buy two save five percent buy four save ten buy six save fifteen and wow. we market that to consumers as part of an incentive to get them to you know buy more right away commit to the series and, and go from there we've actually seen tremendous success in japan we have a, quite a growing business in japan with manga and a large percentage of our sales actually come from these these series bundles there Wow. So, so is this, this series bundle thing is, is live now, but the pricing structure is something that's coming in the near future, right? Exactly. So the, okay. the, the publisher funded, um, the publisher bundle discounts is coming in roughly like a month or two. And with that, we're also start providing kind of insight into series that you've seen some of our, our competitors providing. So you can actually see how we structure your series rather than just kind of, I put in the series name and number what, uh, hopefully they got it right. Uh, we'll, right. we'll be able to show you if if we got it right according to what you were thinking. 
Oh, that is fantastic. And I do understand and I do and I do encourage people listening to this to have some patience because when you're developing things, plans kind of get out of line and things take longer and some of the beta testing and early testing uh, requires you to make changes to the development. So it's just a rough estimate. But um, ideally, this is uh, mid-2022, probably by the end of the year, that'll be something that's that's a live feature for authors to take advantage of and, and publishers, of course. Yeah, most certainly. We'll, we'll have it out. Uh, quite soon. We we added more because we found that publishers sometimes didn't understand what series metadata they had provided us and we needed to provide them more transparency about it. So we kind of added Yeah, because it's you stuff. can't fix it if you can't see what's wrong. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Awesome. So uh that is great. Let's talk about uh, I know there's there's already an existing uh, tool that you made available for authors to use. And I'm not sure a lot of authors have taken advantage of it, but you have this new promotions, uh, I guess I call it a tab over on the left nav. Can you talk a little bit about the, the options and choices and how people can DIY their own promotions on Google Play? Yeah, certainly. So right now there are two types of promotions that we offer. There will be a third, which is the series bundle one I was just talking about. It will live on the same page. Uh, if we want to, we can also get, there'll be a series subscription uh, that's entirely separate, but I'll focus on what we have already. Okay. Uh, so we <laughs> You have, get me excited about these things. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're very excited to talk about it. So that's uh, happy to chat about it. There are two ones today. There's uh, promotional pricing, uh, which is kind of one we already talked about. And then promo codes, promotional pricing, just go to that one, uh, is the ability to, for a book, drop the price for all users. So you can sit, like we said before, schedule a price. I want it to drop by 20% from May 1st to June 1st. And uh, you can do it that way. You can do it in bulk through CSV. And this is changing the price for all users in the Google Play Bookstore. And the second is promo codes. So this is one that we launched uh, about two years ago. And it allows you to Disc, provide a discounted price for a subset of users that you specifically choose. So you're, as most people are familiar with promo codes, you get a code and you can distribute it to whomever you like. And you can provide a discount uh, that is anywhere between zero. It can be entirely free if you wanted to give it out in a newsletter to the first hundred people that can sign up. Uh, or you can say, uh, I want it to be 30% off and uh, they can use that code to get 30% off the normal list price of the book. Oh, that's fantastic. And and one of the things that I believe happens when you create a promo, if you put more than one book in a, in a promo, um, Google Play will automatically build a landing page with just those books on it for you? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. So with a promo code, uh, if you do multiple books, uh, you have, you're giving the user the ability to choose between one of those books. We'll, we're looking to add that to choose multiple. So if you have five books and you want them to choose two That'll, that'll be coming soon. But right now, it's if they, you put in five, let's say, it creates a landing page with all five books, and they can choose one of the books that they want to redeem. So you can imagine uh, if you have like three series, you put in three uh, book ones, and they can choose which series they want to start with. I love that. I love that idea. I mean, I, I just recently took advantage of that because oftentimes authors will put um, the first book in series free, but they may want to get people, encourage them to try you know one of the other books in the series so they can put up the whole rest of the series and say, okay, go get any other one of these books if you want. Pick, you choose. I'm not going to choose for you. You choose, uh, which I think is a great functionality. Um, but it's limited, right? You can't just go and create 15 or 20 promos every month. Uh, there's there's a limit to that? There is a limit. It, it, we think it's, it's fairly high. So you can create three campaigns per month, but each okay. campaign can be 5,000 redemptions. So uh, there's not there's not much uh, of a limit in terms of that. Uh, so it's fifteen thousand per month, uh, right. but you do need to be a little bit strategic with how you want to allocate those or what you want to put in those promotion. Because once you use the three, you got to wait, uh, you know, the thirty days to go to the next month. Right. So I wanted to I wanted to highlight uh, a couple things you said. You mentioned that there's a limit to redemptions and the user has the control over how many do you want to give away for free or how many of these coupon codes do you want to allow at 30% off or 50% off or whatever. Um, it kind of protects the author, but it can also be something used strategically. I think you mentioned something, and I'm just, I want to repeat this because I think it's important for authors is uh, the call to action, uh, urgent sense of urgency is, hey, in newsletter, you have to be one of the first hundred people to click here to get it, right? Or something mm -hmm. like that that just makes it a little bit more exciting instead of people going, yeah, I'll get to it eventually. Yeah, exactly. So uh, you can put anywhere between one and 5,000 as a max redemption for that campaign. 
let's say you put a hundred, you can also put it by country. So I only want to offer this in uh, the UK, for instance, okay. and then only users that are in the UK and the first hundred can redeem it. And you also could put it by time. So you can say, um, you know, the first hundred or by midnight tonight, get to be able to redeem this, this promo code. Okay. Wow. I, I love that idea because that sense of urgency really makes a difference in, in limited short-term promotions. Mm -hmm. Are there, uh, before we get to the next topic that we wanted to discuss, a, a new feature that uh, you've launched for everyone recently that was in beta for a while, are there any other uh, strategies or tips that you would love authors to know about how to sell more on Google Play? One, one that's kind of outside of our platform that I think is general, but I always like to reiterate it is just to make sure where, wherever you're marketing your books to also include Google Play books. Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of different retailers. Users right. choose a lot of times what book they want to read based off of, is it available on the platform that I read on? So right. if you uh, have other retailers there, make sure to put us there. If you do have us there, you should definitely join our affiliate program. You get 7% of all the purchases uh, that a user makes within the first few few days. Um, and then, uh, you can use the other thing I would like to say is if you have uh, a newsletter that you use, the promo code functionality is a good way to bring new users on to, uh, Google Playbooks, uh, whether they purchase through some other means, maybe they purchase in print, they want to purchase an ebook. Um, you know, we are part of Android and play store. So we have a large percentage of users on Android phones or have a great experience for ebooks. That's fantastic. I mean, I'm going to be doing a book signing next Saturday. And what I plan on offering, and I've taken advantage of this, I've created a coupon code with Google Play. And uh, I'm saying, you know, if you buy the book here, I'll, I'll scan this code and it'll take you right to the place where you can get this book for free on ebook now. Uh, and that yeah. way they have the one to read on their phone and then they can walk away with a nice signed copy uh, as well. Yeah, so that, that's I, a great idea. Uh, the other thing I do want to remind listeners and viewers about is, uh, including all the links to all the retailers, including Google Play Books. If you uh, use draft to digital already, you may be taking advantage of books to read.com, the universal book link. And we automatically will go and find the Google Play link to add to it for you. It's one of the functionalities. You can go and add your affiliate code, your Google affiliate code into that as well, so that you're, you've created a universal link. And if you're a huge fan of Google and you want that to be prime, you can slide the Google Play uh, logo right to the very, very top left <laughs> corner. Mm -hmm. So it's the first one that's visible. Uh, so you have that functionality as authors. I just want to remind people of that. Uh, another follow-up question from Jenny. So Jenny was just asking, this is more for me, but she said for the discount, uh, this with a price drop, I assume you mean, Jenny. Is that similar to the tool DDD offers for setting your own regional pricing? Yeah, it's very similar, Jenny. Uh, it's managed territorial prices at draft to digital Google Play, you can go in and you specify the region and the price, and it's very, very comprehensive, but also the, the price promo you can schedule in advance and also do it by by territory. So they're, I think they're very similar uh, similar systems, just a slightly different uh, user interface probably. Mm. It's, they sound pretty similar, and that's exactly right. You can choose country yeah. uh, and date range and obviously price for that. Yeah. So... Um, uh, I'm already seeing a comment to question because I was I was teasing this out, but I wanted to get to I wanted to get to Google Play. So Google Play, the the store, has always had audiobooks. I get my audiobooks there uh, from Find Away Voices. Uh, most of my audiobooks are getting into the Google Play bookstore from Find Away Voices. But I've also I was lucky to be one of the um, beta users of the AI narrated audiobooks. Can you talk about that? Because this is something that you've made available to all users now or all authors? Uh, so we're available in eight countries now for auto narrative audiobooks. Okay, um, which we, is like obviously looking... Canada and the US. <laughs> yeah, Canada, the US, uh, the UK, uh, Spain, Mexico, and Argentina uh, as well. And then Australia, New Zealand. So. Awesome. Okay, so Google Play AI narrator, narration. What is this magical thing that you're talking about? Yeah, so maybe just the, the short story is it's instead of being read by a person, uh, auto narrated audiobooks are read using Google's text to speech technology. To go into the backstory just, just a little bit, we launched audiobooks on the Play Store uh, a little over three years ago, actually, right before I joined. And one thing that we noticed is that there's, there's a massive gap between ebooks and audiobooks. 95% of our ebooks don't have an accompanying audiobook. 
and it's not because some of these eBooks wouldn't make good audiobooks. Some would. Um, obviously, there's some textbooks that maybe you don't want pronounced uh, in for the math formulas, but you know most of them would be audiobooks if it wasn't so much for the cost prohibitive nature of creating an audiobook today. Uh, so we thought, okay, we're, we're Google. We have a great text to speech team, a great research team working on uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Is there something that we can do in this area to make it easier for for publishers to do that? And that is the creation of auto narrated audiobooks. We've been working on this all, the entire time I've been at Google, so uh, three years from you know, initial idea to launching our beta a couple of months ago in, in eight countries. We have found kind of one challenge with creating automated audiobooks is that there are things in an ebook that you maybe don't want in an audiobook. Do you really want your table of contents spoken? No, I want that. I don't want the copyright in there. Um, maybe there's some footnotes that you want excluded. So we've actually gone about the process so that you come into our store, you have an ebook that's already for sale with us that's in EPUB format, which is very important. We want to make sure we don't have to convert from a PDF or something like that. Right. And we convert that to uh, our own document type and they have an editor and they can see exactly what they would uh, see pronounced or spoken in the audiobook. They can fix things, uh, whether it's table of contents or other things to exclude, and they can hear and choose uh, narrators that they want for their audiobook. We have 35 plus narrators um, and a lot of different options. Oh, wow. That is fantastic. And uh, one of the things that I think, uh, I think there's some questions I'm going to pop them up. So first question is Ace Adams asks, does the voice sound human or does it sound like a robot? Mm -hmm. I added that extra. That wasn't the first question. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the, that's the main challenge. So, you know, working as we're part of Google, this is something that has been done uh, in the Google research. Actually, the, it's called Google Brain and other other areas of Google. Uh, and the whole goal is to make it sound as much like a human as possible. Um, so we we think we've gotten to a place where the text to speech starts to sound a lot more like a human. Uh, and you can you can see these for yourself. We have a link that we can we can put up to just listen to some samples. Um, we have a landing page where you can just see some of the different narrators, uh, get a, a minute or so sample of each one to understand it. Quality does vary by the narrator that you select, and it's also a personal preference. The one challenge that we have, uh, which I'm sure you'll be impressed by the, the voices as there, as we've gone through it, we've been impressed ourselves. Uh, but the challenge is that uh, the text-to-speech doesn't always know what it's narrating, right? It's not saying, oh, this is a very kind of... Um, this is a joke that the author, that the, the character is saying. They don't say it in a joking manner because they don't understand right. the text yet. And so we're, we're working to you know make that a possibility. Uh, that is not the current state of it. So if you have text that um, has a lot of emotion, whether it's romance or it's a sci-fi, it's a comedy, um, you need to take that into account as we as we do the audiobook. Okay, cool. Um, and so we have a comment from Elena who said, just made my book on audio narrated audio, audio format. And I must say the voice sounds really, really good. Yeah, that's great to hear. Uh, and I have to say, one of the ways I've used this is, so I have uh, several of my books, I've paid professional narrators and loaded them through Find Away Voices to get them onto Google Play Store. But what I've experimented with is that's a, that cost me a lot of money. So I charge quite a bit of money for that to try and make my money back because that's a business. But uh, Google Play, um, and, and we should just reiterate that this is a free tool. It's a free service that you can use. And I think the only catch is you can take the file and, and, and use it elsewhere. But you, if you do that, you have to publish it to Google, right? That has to be available to Google customers, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. So that's right. For the beta program, it's entirely free. We do plan to have a small nominal fee just to, to cover the cost of creating an audiobook on our side. Um, but... We do have the ability, we do let publishers distribute as wide as they want. As you said, the only ask that we have is that if you do sell it somewhere else, you sell it on our platform as well because we helped create it for you uh, and then you sell it at uh, the same or lower price just to make sure we're competitive in the market. Perfect, perfect, I love that. And and as I was saying, I've got the the, the one I've paid a lot of money for, I've got it up there, it's on Google. So there's my ebook, there's my uh, full length, uh, you know, professionally narrated uh, human voice. Um, but then I've also started to, and I think I only have three or four of them so far, 
then I have the Google AI voice narration. I even created my own little logo to indicate, just to be clear that this mm -hmm. is a, and I think I've used Mike as my narrator. He's one of the voices that's available. Mm -hmm. And I usually make that available for 99 cents because I think, okay, it didn't really cost me anything. Let's make this accessible to more people, which is which is a great thing. But I think in one case, I even made it free because you can, I, I make, make it free. Uh, and I did that to match the ebook, which is also free uh, mm -hmm. as well. So th there's experimentations that you can do as authors. Now, great question from Monica that's related to this is she asks, can we post AI narrated books from Google Play provided we published it on Google Play to YouTube for streaming, for example. Yeah, uh, def you definitely can. Uh, we, ha we have no restrictions on that. If it is free on YouTube, which it, it, it by necessity is free, we right. hope that it's also free on Google Play, but you have the ability to distribute wherever you would like. Okay, which is fantastic. I love that flexibility. I mean, you just, you're giving people tools and you're letting them experiment and play. And you're also doing a lot of learning there too. And I imagine... As, as you mentioned, that the technology is going to continue to improve and continue to get uh, better. One of the questions I sort of had for you is uh, recently because uh, one of my narrators uh, was on vacation and the other one was on honeymoon and, and mm. it was going to be a dual narrated male, female alternating chapter voice. And I thought, oh, we could use Google Play for this, except one of the limitations is I can only pick a single voice. I can't say voice A for chapter one, voice B for chapter B. Or is mm. that something potentially in the works? Uh, definitely in the works, uh, kind of another thing that's, that's hopefully coming soon. This might be a little bit farther out than series bundles, but okay. we're, we're looking to do exactly that. Not even at the, the chapter level, which we will have, but at the word level. So if you have dialogue back and forth, you have, let's say 10 different characters, you could have 10 yeah. different narrators uh, mm. in the book to make sure that you really, uh, get each one gets represented themselves and it provides a little bit, uh, easier understanding. So if I switch from Mike to Heather or something, uh, or Michelle, right. you can, it helps the user, uh, the listener understand it a lot more. Yeah. And I do have to say for anyone out there who's curious about how a book like that would sound, I would say, check out the last few books by Michael Connolly and audio. Uh, the Renee Ballard, Harry Bosch thrillers are alternating male, female voice, and they also do the dialogue bits. And it is a wonderful experience. I kind of fell in love with that, which mm -hmm. is why I, I wanted that for one of my own books. I thought, what a great service. What a great what a great option. Um, and then uh, Stephanie asks, uh, do you have uh, different accents for the voices? Uh, so Stephanie, for example, is looking for a Caribbean. And I would see, I would be looking for, you know, Canadian accent, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe uh, East, East, uh, East Canadian accent, maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. we, we do have different accents. We are limited in the ones that we have. I don't think we have a, unfortunately a Caribbean or, or Canadian, but we, we have, we do have a lot of other ones. I think right. we have in English six or so accents, five or six okay. accents. Right. Um, these are a bit challenging sometimes to get because the way that these voices are created is there's actual voice actors, uh, that come into the studio. We do a recording and we use that to inform what the model sounds like. So we need to bring in people, uh, that have these as part of it. And that's actually kind of a wow. whole Google project to make sure that we have a representative sample of voices, uh, as part of it. Well, I volunteer for, a, you know, Ontario, Canada accent. I have hundreds and hundreds of podcast audio of me just speaking if you want uh, i'm happy to send it off to you guys to help you out if you get want to get a Canadian in there. yeah i will I'll definitely <laughs> talk to the team they it's kind of a whole team as you might imagine for yeah. all of uh google assistant it's uh, as you know google assistant is probably the most prominent google product with a voice and yes. they do a lot of the work and we kind of take a lot of their, the benefits that they do and put them into our product. Yeah, she's listening to us right now, so we have to be careful not to call her out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, um, and I guess the question was about Southern dialects and slang and stuff like that. Uh, we don't have any Southern dialects yet. We unfortunately only have one uh, American accent. Uh, we have a British, Indian, Australian uh, accents today. We right. are always looking to add more. that. That's an area that has been challenging for us because we, when you do Google Assistant, you don't have a lot of that diversity of voice, and it's much right. more important in audiobooks than you would in an assistant. Right. So um, that is something that we're looking to add, but we don't have it today. In terms of slang, so this is kind of one area that I wanted to talk about. We have the ability to do pronunciation corrections. So yeah. if you go into the tool and you put in some um, things that are written, how they might be different than spoken. So 
um, let's say you put in four pounds, but instead of pounds, you put in uh, LBS, it actually says four pounds. Uh, so we convert uh, the text into what we think that the user is trying to say. Okay. Uh, and there's other examples of this. If if you put in six forward slash five forward slash twenty twenty two, you know it'll say the date as if it as if it was there. I don't know what date I said, but let's say it was June fifth, twenty twenty two. It'll say it just like that, uh, and okay. you have the ability to make corrections like that. So let's say you have a lot of new names in your your book. That I the example I always go to is uh, Hermione when uh, right. it was pronounced Hermione. Or they didn't no one knew exactly how to say it. And yeah. um, so in this example, you can just go in and you can right click on a single word and you can say, I want to edit the pronunciation. And you can either type in what you want to try to make it a little bit more phonetically spelled out, or you can actually speak it into a mic and it records what you're saying and tries to interpret uh, exactly how it should be said. And then you wow. save it down and you can apply to all instances in the book or a few instances if it's wow. uh, unique to that, that area. That is fantastic because I, I didn't even know that you did that because prior when I when I did uh, some of my nonfiction books for writers, it couldn't pronounce Lefebvre as most humans mm -hmm. can't either. But uh, what I all I did is I went into the manuscript and anytime my name was mentioned, I changed it to L E F A V E and it got it perfectly. So yeah, I had exactly. to do a little bit of find and replace, but I didn't realize that it was doing the machine learning on the fly when you when you go in and uh, enter that. That's fantastic. Yeah. And we do we do have a find and replace as well, so you can you can use that. Um, and we do use the information to hopefully correct things in the future, uh, but it is still on a book level, so you do need to need to do it by every book. Uh, again, there's always things to build. We can always uh, look to build it across, so you can do it across books and things like that. But wow. that's kind of what we would love to hear from from publishers. What are the tools that you think would make the product uh, even better? Oh, that's fantastic. I'm just going to share this uh, feedback from uh, Kendra, who says, uh, I did try using a year as a setting, 2140. And uh, I did have to manipulate the text because it was reading it, obviously, as 2140, because it's a computer. But um, that, that may be part of the learning on the fly, too, right, in the context? Yeah, I think that is probably a good example of our... Um... It's called text norm. Uh, doesn't know how to interpret twenty one forty uh, because it's so much in the future. A lot of the things that Google <laughs> deals with, it's like uh, they don't typically have to say those types of dates. Uh, so that might right. be partially it. It yeah. might al it also they also do look at the context of the words around that word. Right. Uh, okay. But sometimes we get it wrong, and that's why we we built the tool so that publishers can fix that. See, I'm, I'm wondering if the somewhere in the Bizac codes is like, well, it's science fiction, <laughs> so we're yeah. gonna we're gonna make this assumption. Well, even the even the Y2K. I'm going back into tech. I don't know if you're in tech during the Y2K bug issue. You're probably too young, mm -hmm. but um, all that a lot of the computer systems did was they didn't fix the underlying problem. We just assumed if the year was greater than 50 that it was 19, and if it was less than 50, it was 20. Yeah, uh, we're gonna have a problem in 2049. I'm guessing. <laughs> so yeah. It's exactly. <laughs> it, it, it's it's assumptions like that that we kind of get into trouble where we're making guesses about what it is versus just letting the machine figure it out in general. And right. you know, when publishers provide these corrections, they're actually informing us to make better selections and, and pronunciations the next time. So it is right. a continuously learning learning environment. I love that. I love that. So another question related to audiobooks that Monica has is, uh, is Google Books planning to add a way for authors to upload their own uh, human narrated voice? Uh, so, you know, Monica probably has purchased the rights to audiobooks and would like to just load them directly. Is that going to be a possibility? Uh, yes, it will. Uh, that is something that we've also been working on. We have been a bit slow to roll it out, partially because of we want to make sure we do it in a very... Um, a logical way for us to make sure that we're dealing with pirated content. Uh, right. It's always a challenge to deal with pirated content as your, as an open platform, because anyone can come in saying, Hey, I own uh, yeah. this book and, and we know that they don't have the rights to it. Yeah. So we're trying to do that in a very um, consistent way as we go to audiobooks. And there's some new tools that we have to build to make sure we're able to detect pirated content. But we, again, are, are, are working on that one and we're almost done. So I think that's something that you can expect, uh, maybe by the end of the year that you have the ability to upload uh, your own audiobook, whether it's human narrated or even uh, machine narrated from another platform. Right. Oh, and yeah, we understand. We understand the struggle when you have a free tool available, how um, sometimes not nice people try to use them too. 
<laughs> yeah. so, it's it's a difficult challenge, purposes. but yeah, there are exactly. some good solutions. It just takes time to build. <laughs> so I'm just scrolling through some of the questions, wanting to make sure I got to uh, I got to um, uh, most of them that that came in. Um, can I ask a question about the Google Play ebook reader, or is that outside of your realm? Uh, yeah, you can ask about it. We actually don't have an ebook reader, uh, but um, we we exist on basically any type of phone. So we're on iOS, Android, and web uh, okay. and tablets and things like that. Because um, Tra Tracy had asked a question about um, potentially it was with one of the tablets, and I'm not sure. Maybe this is something she can uh, email in to support, but uh, that there were some issues with it that we can the reader experience. Um, but she says it does have some powerful differences and advantages. And I'm assuming she's maybe talking either about the Android or the iOS version. I'm not sure which one. And this is a dedicated e-reader? E I thought, oh, I thought she was talking about the app, but um, oh, the app. you said there isn't a, there isn't a Google There is Play. no e-reader. Um, there are some uh, e-readers that actually use Android as an operating system and they try to, and they sideload uh, play on it. Uh, so there, there are ways that you can get an e-reader that has ours, but it's not officially sanctioned by us, but uh, it does have it. Okay. Uh, oh, and Tracy, does, yes, there is a reader. I use it. So, oh, interesting. Um as I'm trying to keep up with the uh, comments, uh, just uh, uh, Nana just asked, "Is Google Play now on Draft to Digital?" No, Nana, uh, it, we you can't get to Google Play through Draft to Digital. We just wanted to interview Ryan because we love Google Play too, and we want to make sure authors are empowered and informed on all the options they have for publishing wide. The um, question is, how does Google handle Bow and Bow, or or was it Bow and Bow? I'm not sure the context, Mike. <laughs> yeah, so this is an area that we've I have learned much more than I thought I would ever learn uh, about. So when there's a homograph, two words that are spelled the same, that are pronounced differently, how do we know? Uh, yeah. So we have uh, some rules in place to say, like, if this word is before this word, it's said like bow. If this word is before this word, it's said like bow. Uh, we can't cover the entire cases of when this occurs. So we also right. try to use machine learning to understand uh, whether we're saying in the right context. Um, as we said before, we don't always get this right. We think we get it right a large percentage of the time. So if I grabbed my bow and went to shoot the arrow, hopefully we said bow, and then say I went to bow to uh, the person next to me, we would say in that context. There's other examples here. It's actually a lot more homographs than people would think. Uh, yeah. But if you go into edit pronunciation, we will actually show you the alternative pronunciations that we were considering, oh, uh, really? if, there, if there were any, um, which there will be other ones, whether if it's a homograph or if it's a date, you can say a date in many different ways. Uh, we, we provide all of those options so they can, instead of just typing it, they can just click, oh, that one is meant to be bow, apply in this instance. Let me look at the next time to see if they got it right. Okay. Um, thank you. That is that is so cool. I didn't even know that that functionality was there. I'm so excited to go back in and play with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Um, uh, Ryan, uh, where can people find out more about Google Play Books? Is it? I, I mean, most people just go to Google and search, right? That's how they find things in the universe. <laughs> uh, that is, that is our hope, both in our product and broadly at Google. Uh, but that's exactly what you can do for our for our platform. You can go to Google, type in Google Play Books Publishing. You'll uh, be directed to our online sign up flow. If you don't have an account, uh, you can learn more there. You can also add auto narrated to that query, and you'll go to our our page to learn more about auto narrated audiobooks. Awesome. And, and again, I think you had the URL for g.co slash play slash auto narrated. Uh, if you want to look, uh, that's for some samples that you were talking about, right? Yep. Samples. And you can go in to the either create an account or go into the account directly and see where you can create auto narrated audiobooks. Awesome. Ryan, I want to thank you so much for spending time with me today. I want to thank the, the wonderful live audience for asking some fantastic questions questions. Uh, if you like this show, you can check us out most often every Thursday, one o'clock Eastern. You can uh, find what, who we're interviewing. Uh, we've got stuff lined up for the next many, many weeks. You can bookmark d2dlive.com just to be uh, notified of it. You can follow us on the various social medias. You can get insights over at d2d.tips slash insight, and you can subscribe to us on YouTube, Facebook, as a matter of fact, go to almost any URL and just type in slash draft digital at the end. And if we're there, you'll usually see us popping up. 
Ryan, thank you again so much for hanging out with me today. I'm happy to join. Thanks for having me. And uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks. You too.